Okay, I'm Steve Mays from Solwise, and what I'd like to do now is a quick video uh, showing you the GUI setup of the ENS 500, and go through some of the setup screens. It's not a definitive setup video, but shows you uh, the important stuff. So the ENS 500 is an ingenious outdoor uh, 5 gigahertz unit using 300 meg 11N. Um, now there are actually two versions of the ENS 500. There's the ENS 500, that's the picture you can see here, just blow the picture. Uh, now this version of the product is uh, has two 10 dB dual polarized antennas actually built into the front of it, uh, giving you a semi-directional operation. And the other version, which I can actually show you, if I go back a page and scroll down a little bit more, and this is the other version, which is the 500 EXT. Click on the picture of that. Exactly the same piece of equipment, except instead of built-in um, semi-directional 10 dB antennas, it's actually got two 5 dB uh, 5 gigahertz Omni antennas on the, on the top. So the 500, 500 EXT, not big products, each of them is probably about the size of an A5 piece of paper. Uh, if you go for the EXT version, I would look, judging by the look at the video, the, uh, so the image here, the actual antennas are bigger than the actual product itself. So let's go through the setup screen on the ENS 500. Uh, so by default, like most ingenious products, it's on 1.1, and the login by default is admin. Admin. Don't want to stay in that. So this is the default setup screen. Um, slightly old school setup screen. Uh, the ENS 500 has been now around for now for. Oh, I'm thinking probably about two years. Very popular piece of kit. We like it um, because it's a nice, good seller. There's about a hundred a month going out, and we don't get any aggro from the punters. It just goes out and it does what it says on the tin. Uh, now it's primarily uh, used as a uh, as a bridge device, either in a point to point or point to multi point setup. So, for example, you might have an ENS 500 at building A, connect bridging transparently to an ENS 500 at building B, so that way you can have a transparent link between the two buildings. Or you go for a point to multi-point setup where, for example, you might have an ENS 500 EXT, remember that's the one with the Omnis, stuck in the middle of an area, and a number of ENS 500s around uh, the area actually aimed back and bridging back to the central 500 EXT unit. So that's what we call a point to multi-point setup. Uh, so that's the common uh, common way this product's used. It does support other modes like access point, that sort of thing. But honestly, nobody ever uses this for those modes. It's only ever used as a point-to-point -point product. So let's go through the various setup screens um, in the order that you probably want to be playing around with them. So the first thing is the IP settings down here under the system menu. So this is where you can set the IP address of the unit. No rocket science, just give it an IP address that suits the network you're on and just make sure it doesn't clash with anything else or any other bridging devices on the network. So that's quite easy, uh, I won't bother changing that for the video. Go back to operational mode. First thing you probably want to do in here is set the country. So let's scroll down to, now it supports uh, the three UK bands. This is slightly old hat nowadays because uh, yeah, this dates back to where there was UK uh, band A, band B and band C. Uh, now the European Union has towed the line and realised that the UK has done its 5 gig bands the correct way. But of course they're not happy with calling it UK band B, and UK band C and UK band A. They want to stamp their own little label on it. So nowadays you probably wouldn't see on the latest generation products uh, something called UK band B and band C for example. You'd have something, I think it's called uh, Uni, Uni 2 I, Uni 2 1B, or something like that. So, but you'll, you'll know what it means. So, the way it works is you have three bands. On this product, you've got United Kingdom, which is the band A. Band A, indoor only 5 gig. So, you can rule that one out. Band C, band C, outdoor only but with a license that you have to purchase from Ofcom. Not a big license, but in my opinion, waste of time. 
Band C is such a small frequency range area nowadays that it's really not much cop for anything. Um, 11M products struggle to get free available channel space there, and 11AC, not hope in hell. So my advice is just ditch band C. Uh, in the old days when we just had 20 meg wide channels, the old 11A bands or something like that, then it may be worth doing it, but not worth doing nowadays. So UK band B. Now UK band B is indoor and outdoor. It gives us um, uh, 30 dBm 1 watt um, RF power, or uh, EIRP power, sorry. And it gives us uh, loads of channels. Um, top of my head, is it 15 channels? I can't remember. 15, 20 megabyte channels, can't remember. Something like that. Now, operational modes, as I say, it does support a whole different pile of modes like access point and client bridge and routers and repeaters, but really the aim of this product is as a point to point link. And the best point to point scenario is to what it's doing with what is WDS bridge mode. So, WDS bridge mode, so the device is set up in WDS bridge mode to give you a nice transparent symmetric connection between all the devices. The other modes um, will still work, but they may or may not give you a truly symmetric and truly transparent connection. WDS Bridge is the best one to go for. So I'm going to say, oh, actually before I skip this screen, let me just go through this green mode up here. Uh, green ticked means I want you to ensure that I only, only can select the uh, UK legal or UK band B legal channels on RF power. If you untick green, it gives you more flexibility to choose your own channels and your own RF power. But of course, you should be legal, leave it ticked green. I'm going to save and apply. So, just save and apply those. This does require a reboot, but most of the other settings we can actually do um, block change. But this one does actually require a reboot. So what it's just doing now is it's just applying those changes uh, and it will restart the device and re-log in for us. Uh, the pop-up blocker is just a Firefox thing, basically. Do I want to allow or disallow this pop-up? So we'll leave that running. Uh, we're up to uh, 60%. And that is 70 and 80 and 90 so back at the beginning again as you can see it now says UK band B there and if I go down to the operation of wider settings it notice it now says WDS bridge so what was the next stage that you want to set up? Well, remember we're doing WDS bridge mode. So the next thing is to go to WDS link settings. Now the way a WDS link works is each device links to a specific MAC address of another device. So in a uh, WDS bridge setup of, let's say, an A talking to a B, A needs to be given the MAC address of B, B needs to be given the MAC address of A. It's that easy. Surprise how many people get it wrong. Now, uh, each of these devices can bridge up to four remote devices. So going back to that example where we've got an EXT in the middle and a number of ENS 500 surrounding it, aiming it in, the EXT can cope with up to four ENS 500s trying to bridge to it. So the way we would set that up is the EXT unit would have to have the four MAC addresses the MAC address of each of the individual four remote units entered here, and obviously enable. And the each of the ENS 500 would just need to have the MAC address of the central EXT unit. Not rocket science, amazing how many people get it wrong. Now for this demonstration I'm just going to put a uh, made up um, MAC address in here, doesn't really matter. The only final thing we've got on the screen is uh, link security. My fit, my honest opinion is I don't think it's worth putting any link security on a WDS link because with the WDS link, as, as I've already mentioned, devices will only talk to another device with a MAC address that you've pre-entered on this table. So as far as I can see, link security doesn't matter. If you're really paranoid, yes, you can set up some form of Wi-Fi security on that link.
Once you've done that, click on Accept. So that's stored the settings. Interesting to note as we're going along here now, this under status, save reload. Now it says four. Now what that means is, what I've been doing when I accepted that, I saved the settings into the device, but I haven't applied the settings. The difference between the two. Saved means that they are just stored there, but that it's not running with those settings, those store settings at the moment. Amazing how many phone calls you get from people that say, oh, I've told it to accept the settings and they're not working. It must be broken. No, it's not broken. It's just you doing something wrong. So, if we want to apply the settings, what we have to do is we have to click on Save Reload. And we do Save and Apply. Okay. So what it's doing now is it's take it, taking those settings that we've stored into the unit and now applying them to the actual device. Now this is quite a good feature because it does mean that we can do a whole pile of different changes and not have to wait between each change for the settings to be applied. We can do it all en masse at the end in one block apply process. So it does mean that we haven't got this irritating wait for, I don't know what it is, 45 seconds or something. Each time we do a change, we can do them all in one go and apply them all in one go. So we just wait for this to finish. And 80, 90-ish. Right, I'll back up again. So remember we did the WS link settings. Next on the list, we've got wireless network. <coughs> So on a wireless network, we can tell it what channel to be running on. Uh, so it's 11 AN, so we can go use 40 meg wide channels. Now, in a bridge setup, you have to tell each unit what channel to be working on. And obviously, very important that if you want A to talk to B, they both have to be operating on the same channel. So make sure whatever channel you pick is the same for all the units in the bridge, bridge setup. So if I click on down arrow here, this is showing us all of the 40 meg wide channels available. It doesn't really matter which one you choose. Though you want to choose one that's hopefully not busy being used by everybody else. But whichever one you choose, make sure it's the same for all of the devices in the bridge. I'm going to leave it at the default 100. No point in playing with that. And let's go to wireless and advanced settings. Um, only thing really worth mentioning in here. Well, I suppose there's a couple of things. First thing is the distance. The, uh, the reason there's a distance parameter is so it can tune the timeouts for traffic sending from between the various units. Uh, it's fairly important to get that accurate to what you're doing. Uh, one kilometer is the minimum, but if you're going two kilometers, change to two kilometers because it will probably improve the speed and improve the stability and reliability of the link. The only other thing that's probably worth mentioning here is this rather useful function called traffic shaping. By default it's disabled, but if you enable it, you can actually split up the available traffic bandwidth between the various WDS links. Uh, quite a nice little function that. <coughs> so that's our main settings for all of the Wi-Fi. At this stage, this should be up and working, assuming you've got everything right in your settings so far. So to test that, what you would do is you go back up here to WDS link list. What this do is it would list you the status for each of the WDS settings that you've, uh, WDS link settings that you've entered. Remember we entered one with a dummy MAC address. So I say WDS link um, with that dummy MAC address, blah, blah, blah. Obviously it's saying down because there is no other device with that dummy MAC address for it to connect to. There was a sensible MAC address in here and you had another device set up. This would show link status up and it would give you a signal strength for that link. Um, common thing people complain about is they might say it's working from A to B but not from B to A. And what that means is A knows about B but B doesn't know about A. And that is always because you've made a cock up putting the MAC address in. So you haven't told A the correct MAC address of B and B the correct MAC address of A. Get the MAC addresses right and believe me this always works. 
Um, now, what else can I show you? I'll just go through some of the other screens. Not that they mean much, really. Done the main configuration. Uh, administration, you can change login, uh, login username, password. What else have we got? We've got backup and restore settings. Fairly obvious what these means. Backup the settings, actually default reboots. And uh, down here we've got, do we want it to re auto reboot? I don't know, once a day or something like that. My advice, it shouldn't really be necessary. There should be no necessary to actually regularly reboot things, but you can, the option's there if you want it. Uh, well, we've got firmware upgrade. Tell you what that is. Select a file to upgrade it. Uh, time settings. Set the time on the device, or if you want to use internet time or something like that. What else we've got down here that's worth looking at? We've got uh, log. Uh, so we actually got the option to do a local log, or we can uh, log to a syslog server for um, checking stats, etc., etc., from the device. And that's, oh, I'll just go diagnostics, show you diagnostics. That's just the normal pings and trace route. It also has a speed test. Um, I personally haven't found the speed test um, screens on these various bridging devices to be very accurate. If you want to do a speed test properly, you really need to do it between a uh, PC at each end, or the, or the network at each end of the link. And don't do it just copying a file using Windows. That will give you a rubbish result, You're completely accurate. What you have to do is you have to run a proper speed test program between those two computers, like iPerf or something like that, which will enable you to do multiple stream speed testing. That's the only way to get an accurate throughput speed test. Um, this will tell you if the link's working, but it won't really give you a, a, a very accurate figure. And that's it. I think I've shown everything. As you say, it's not rocket science. Uh, change it to WDS Bridge. Um, put the WS link settings in, i.e. the MAC addresses of the opposing units you want to bridge to. Save and apply. That's it. That's all you have to do. Thank you very much.